I imagine this is probably going to be pretty short. I'm not doing the greatest tonight. And um, we've discussed this throughout Jeremiah, but it's, as we've talked about before, the theme is really repentance in Jeremiah. And this chapter is going to explain to us what is not repentance. (laughs) So, uh, and I think that it might actually be convicting uh, because frankly, I think a lot of us think that this might be repentance, uh, what they do, and uh, it's not. So as we've seen many times before, we have false ideas of repentance throughout Jeremiah. This is yet another one that we're going to see here in chapter uh, 34. Uh, So anyone want to read chapter 34? Let's break it up so one person doesn't have to read the whole thing. It's not too long. Uh, How about 1 through 15? Yeah, Dom? And then 16 to the end. Okay. Bring them back to this city. They will fight against it and capture it and burn it down. 
I will also make the towns of Judah desolate, so that there will be no one living in them. Okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, what's going on here? God promises Zedekiah that basically he's going to do for him what the other king, he didn't really do for the other kings, which is um, that uh, the dog messed me up. <laughs> uh, uh, that he's going to actually give him an honorable burial. He's actually, he's not going to be killed. In fact, we, we know that he's actually taken into Babylon and he ends up like eating at the table of the king and he's treated really well and then they actually like uh, he's mourned when he when he dies so why does god suddenly promise zedekiah this like jehoiakim he's like your dead body is gonna be thrown out in the street no one's gonna actually bury you uh you're gonna be like treated like a piece of dung it's like what wow wow that's uh that's a big difference why does he say this to zedekiah He, well, what what happens in the chapter is that <clears throat> he realizes that the people have done something wrong by holding their Hebrew slaves uh, slaves too long, and so he says to the people, "Hey, we, let, let's let's make a covenant, and that covenant's going to be to obey the law that God gave that you were not supposed to." And God, of course, quotes the law here. You're not supposed to keep your slaves more than seven years like that. You're to let them go on the seventh year. That's, you know, the year of Jubilee and whatnot. Um, they weren't doing that. They're holding on to them. If you hold on to a slave who's not supposed to be a slave, what does the Bible consider that? Yeah, kidnapping. And the, the penalty for kidnapping is what? Death. Because you still, you're stealing a man's life. So... They're getting the death penalty. Nebuchadnezzar's coming against them. Uh, they're about to destroy the city. But notice what he says at the end. At the end, God says, you know, I'm going to bring this stuff back upon you because Nebuchadnezzar, for the moment, has stopped. They've stopped besieging. Because for the moment, it looked like Israel was going to actually try to obey the Lord in something. So Zedekiah, like, again, the Lord's just looking even at this point from like, are you going to obey me at all? Is there going to be any repentance from you at all? And so for the moment, it looked like, yeah, so Zedekiah makes this covenant and, and it literally to, to make a covenant in scripture, I think we've talked about before, literally in Hebrew, it's to cut a covenant. So karat barit, um, to cut a covenant is referring to the fact that you cut animals in half. So you kill these animals. It's all bloody and gross and everything. You you put, put both pieces of the animals on either side. Got all this blood in between and guts and everything like that. And, and you both, whoever you're making a covenant with, you walk between it. Because what it's supposed to say is, if I don't hold this covenant, if I don't, if I don't actually follow through, may I be like these animals that we just cut apart. And that's why God says, because you actually didn't keep it, uh, I'm going to cut you apart like these animals. Uh, you're and, and Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in and do that. But notice what they do first. They go ahead and they make this covenant and they free their slaves. So they obey the law. They actually repent, shuv. They, they turn away from their evil and they let them go. And because of that, God relents for the moment. Nebuchadnezzar stops. It looks like things are going to go well. But then they're kind of like, ah, you know, I... Stuff around here needs to get done. You know, well, I'm sure God, I'm sure God's fine with that because, you know, our, our household's not functioning and, hey, we're, we're providing meals for these people and da, 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 on and on and on, whatever the justifications might be. They go back on it and they go and they grab these slaves. They let go. I said, no, 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 you're going to be my slave again. So they go back on their word. Here's what repentance is not. I think that's, this is the whole point of this chapter. Repentance is not, I'm sorry, God. I'm not going to do that again. Five minutes later, you do it. That's American Christianity, and it's something that's bred into us. And we think that that's okay. And God's like, 
Look, I think the passage is saying, yeah, for the five minutes, I'm going to relent. But you're not forgiven for the previous thing if you go ahead and do it five minutes later. This is really important. You're not forgiven for any of your previous sins if you continue to rebel against God later. All he does is pick up where he left off. Now, if you genuinely repent and stop doing it and you turn around, then he won't ever pick up where he left off. You are genuinely forgiven. But if you're going to just go back on your word, then as he says here, I'm going to fill the houses with your dead bodies. You're going to be like this covenant. You're going to be destroyed like these animals. In other words, I'm going to kill you. He literally says, uh, you're, you're going to fill the, the, the houses with the bodies that I kill, he says. And how does he kill them? He says in the very same verse, because I'm turning away from you. God's going to turn away. God's not going to fellowship with you while you're in sin. Now, if you want to live a life of days and days under the wrath of God and five minutes here and five minutes there when you're not under the wrath of God, you know, uh, more power to you. But at the end of the day, that's not what we're, call, what we're called to as Christians. We're called to actually repent. And so by repent, what does he mean? He means, just like Isaiah says, cease to do evil, learn to do good. Now, I was also going to go to chapter 35. I didn't do that yet. But 35 actually uses the word shuv. And I think, uh, Sherry, do you have the Net Bible? So you know how the Net translation, the Net Bible translate shuv? Uh, some, some, some of your, your, uh, Bibles are going to translate it, repent. Some of your Bibles are going to translate, turn away, uh, something like that. But net actually, I think describes what biblical repentance is. It, it literally says, uh, you stop doing evil and learn to do good. That's what shuv actually means in the context when, when people are being rebuked for sin, stop doing what you're doing, do what's right. Um, in Luke, the passage when it says, when your brother comes to you, you forgive him. It, it, brother, he comes to you and he says, I repent. And if he comes to you seven times a day, you forgive him. The phrase, I repent, doesn't mean I'm sorry. I feel bad that I did that. Would you please not feel bad about me anymore? That's not what it means. I repent is in the present. Actually, it, it means I am repenting. In other words, your brother's telling you, I'm turning away from what I did to you. I'm not going to do it anymore. And I'm going to fix whatever I can that's broken. It's Zacchaeus saying, I stole from you. I'm going to return seven times, you know, the amount that I stole from you. And it's when Zacchaeus says that, that Christ says to him, Today, salvation has come to this household. Repentance means you stop sinning. You fix what you broke. You learn to do good. In fact, fixing what you broke is part of doing good. Do what is right. I cannot tell you how many people I've seen who they say they're going to stop it and then they just continue again, they never are forgiven then for that previous thing. I've forgiven people for all sorts of sins they've done against me. I'm sure you have too. And then they do it again. God does not consider that a forgiven sin. Now, obviously, if the person is genuinely trying to overcome a sin they're struggling with, that's where Christ is like, if they come to you seven times and they tell you, I'm repenting, I'm repenting then obviously like you believe your brother, they're genuinely trying to do it. They're having a hard time, whatever in doing it. You want to forgive them because God forgives you that way. In reality, we all kind of do this, but be warned like anything, like any sin, if you don't stop doing it, it may evidence the fact that you just are not in submission to God at all. And in fact, you have the death penalty on you. Now, 
um, this is the point where someone brings the gospel in, right? Jesus Christ came and he died for you. But it's important to understand, like the grace of God has appeared to us through Jesus Christ, who has taken that penalty because we, in fact, are guilty and we do have the death penalty on us through uh, through the law. And so Christ has come into the world and he's taken that death penalty for us. But as Paul says, the grace of God has appeared to us in the world that we might deny all ungodliness. In other words, that now we can actually have a repentance that lasts because we actually have a power from faith and love that gives us a spirit that de that desires to actually do the things of God. So don't let the devil deceive you into thinking, well, I just can't overcome this. I, I, I'm just, this, this is just going to be my life. That's it. So I'm just going to continue on. And then I'm going to say, sorry, when I feel the fear of God on me, and then I'm going to let it go when I don't feel the fear of God. And it's like, don't live like that. You have the power now to overcome this. You have the power to truly repent. These people, they don't really know God. So in reality, even though he's calling them to repentance, they can't repent. I don't mean that they can't like, you know, ontologically, they could, they could stop doing what they're doing, but they don't want to. They don't want to repent. We're not like that. Paul says we've been given the spirit of God so that we don't do what our flesh wants to do. So we actually do have a power in us that can overcome the desire to do evil. Now, just to be very clear, because we have a flesh and a spirit, you're never going to get rid of the desire to do evil that your flesh has. Your flesh will always desire to do what God views as evil. It's always going to see as good what God sees as evil. And it's going to push you in that direction. The Christian life is about having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to such an extent and having such an extent of love for God and for one another that our spirit desires more its thing, which is love, then our flesh desires its thing. And that's how it wins. But you're always going to have two desires in that regard. <clears throat> I just say that to say that um, you'll always be tempted to repent and then five minutes later take it back. But know that you have the power to stop doing that. You actually have the power to get out of that pattern. You actually can. And I don't mean you can in your flesh and I don't can on your own volition and will. I mean, because of the spirit of God, if you abide in Jesus Christ, you have all that you need for life and godliness. As the scripture says, uh, you have been given the Holy Spirit. You have the very power of God. You are partakers, as Peter says, of the divine nature. And nothing is more powerful than God. You are now the sons and daughters of the living God. You have his power in you to overcome sin. So that your repentance is not this garbage where you get emotional like Saul. It's like, oh, David, I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I'm so sorry. I, I, yeah, I shouldn't be trying to kill you. What am I doing? And then later, you know, he's like, you know what, that David, that I'm going to go kill him. That, that's a man avoid of the spirit. But you are people of the spirit. You people are transformed. You're able to have a consistent repentance so that you can actually stop doing evil against God and against one another. And you can do what's right instead. So really important, as we talk, we've talked about many times, sorry is not repentance. Um, telling God that you're going to stop and then five minutes later isn't really the repentance God is looking for. If you hear his voice today and you are in sin, Repent, and by repent, the scripture means stop doing it. Learn to abide in God. Learn to have your joy and your peace in God, in Jesus Christ. Let that be your comfort, not your sins that you've grown accustomed to. They're not your peace. They're your chains. They're your slavery. Christ is your freedom. 
Uh, any any comments or questions on the passage? Unfortunately, they don't repent. Uh, they go back and they're destroyed. They're they're killed, just as God says. Where are you looking? Which passage? Um, He's giving Zedekiah to them no matter what. He's already said that at the get-go. Like, because of all the sins they've committed, idolatry and all that stuff, he's still going in exile. But because he does this one thing, he's like, all right, well, then I'll grant you this. I'm not going to. I don't know if he backpedaled, but at least he tried to, like, cause some righteousness in the community. And God's like, look, God, this is interesting. Jesus comes on the scene. He actually says this. He says, um, don't fear, little children. My father wants to give you the kingdom. Like, God wants to forgive you. It's not like he's trying to withhold it. He wants to give you life. He is life. He wants to produce life in people. So he has a desire to actually that you be saved. So he's just looking for anything that he can like justly do it. If he can justly give you life, then he's going to do it. But he can't justly give you life if you're in sin. And so if you're going to repent even a little bit, then he's going to give you a little bit of life because he's just looking to do it. So I think same thing with Zedekiah. He's like, I can't stop what's going on completely because all the sin that you're, you've done and are continuing in, frankly, yeah, and, and, and all the answers before, and it's just built up and all that. Um, however, I, I will do this one thing for you. I'm not going to make you die like a dog, as Jehoiakim did. Uh, actually, gonna, you're going to have an honorable death, and you'll have food to eat. And so, you know, you'll, you'll be honored. And um, so God's looking to do this. And he's looking to do this in your life as well it's like he's just looking for any area like any obedience any repentance he's just looking to bless look at how he, he treats the world that they are going to go to hell they are damned and yet if they just do any little good it's it's almost like god's like all right well i'm gonna reward that i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna, I'm gonna do that I, like just trying to give life to people if any sort of like turning from evil any sort of like do, doing of good god rewards like at the end of the day, we don't know if the Egyptian, uh, um, I want to say bridesmaids, they're not bridesmaids, the Egyptian uh, midwives, we don't know if they're really believers or not, but God blesses them because of the good that they do. And it's like, at the end of the day, it's like, I, I really think we have a wrong view of God. We think that he's like trying to hold over us. He's trying to keep us from all the things we really want to do. And it's like, he's trying to keep us from death. And all he wants to do is give us life, but he's not going to do it unjustly. If, like these people, the Lex Talionis kicks in. If you are going to kidnap people into slavery, you're going to take their lives. I'm going to take your lives. I have to. I'm a just God. It's the Lex Talionis. It's the law of reciprocation. It has to happen. But if you relent, I'm just looking for you to If you relent of that, I'll relent of, of the punishment. And, of course, he can do that because of Jesus Christ. Because Christ then takes that penalty. But he only takes that penalty for people who are repentant. And they want to be restored to God. Does that answer the question? That's, that's why. So he's going no matter what. But, but the manner in which he goes, <laughs> it's going to be different. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah. Josiah as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, God wants to show mercy. I mean, he's, again, he's looking to give life where he can. If he has to bring a judgment, then he will. But if he can spare even one person from that judgment, he will. Or if he can make that judgment lighter on one person, he will. There's a reason why there are, we believe there are degrees in hell. We don't believe that hell is equally as bad for everyone. I mean, I think it's bad, but I don't think it's equally as bad for everyone. There's going to be a difference between like, you know, grandma who like baked everybody cookies and, and, and always had a kind word for everybody and just try to love everybody and Hitler. Like there's a difference <laughs> and God's looking to be lenient and merciful where he can. All 
All right, any other comments, questions? Is that helpful? It's not as easy. And that's why we always pick the easy one. It's easier to say sorry. And then we, we think that, well, it's not just saying sorry. I'm going to say sorry really, really sincerely. Like, I'm going to get really emotional about my sorry. And that, then God's really going to see how emotional I am about my sorry. And he's going to forgive me based on that. It's like, that's not, that's nothing to do with repentance. Well, I think, too, it can be a little um, concerning because if you, if you aren't saved, but you think you're saved and you see consequences removed because you said you're sorry, that can fool you into thinking you're actually redeemed. In your right. Life. Yeah. And that's scary. Well, what it is, is it, um, we're, you know, as I was said, we're tricksy little hobbitses, right? We're, we're, uh, we are actually trying to ma manipulate God using our emotions, the way we manipulate other people. Uh, the way like a woman tries to man manipulate a man with her tears. Uh, we're trying to do that with God. Um, we're not going to be able to, Judas is really, really sorry. He's called the son of perdition, damnation. He goes to hell. Christ even says, I, I, I haven't lost any except him. I did lose him. So that's a confirmation. Judas did not go to heaven. What does Judas do? He feels really, really, so he is sincerely sorry. He even confesses to the priests, I have condemned an innocent man. But then he doesn't seek God through Jesus Christ. The cross could have covered Judas. But instead, he seeks his own remedy, which is, I killed a man, therefore I must be killed. And so he kills himself. Yeah, there's uh, Paul make, makes a statement in Romans 2 that people have a tendency to think God's mistake, God's patience for his approval. And what Paul's trying to say is that God doesn't approve of you. <laughs> He's being patient toward you that you might repent. And I think that the problem is, is that we, we do that. We think, oh, things are bad. God's angry. I'm going to tell him I'm really sorry. And I'm going to just make all these vows and covenants and stop doing it. Da then things are good. Oh, God's all right. All right again with me. And I'm not saying that God's not all right with you. It may be that because you said I'm repenting, God forgives you. I think he does. But in that interval of time, if you're just going to go back to it, and then you're going to be under the wrath of God, even while things seem like they're okay. So we can't judge. We almost, we want to constantly judge things by omens, right? This is why the Bible says, don't, don't do this. Don't judge by omens. Don't judge by what's happening in your life. You could be under the wrath of God and you think everything is going great. Like you have to judge whether or not you are in sin by the scripture because your life's not going to tell you that. And we have the reverse effect too. When things go bad, we think, oh, well, something's wrong. I did something wrong. And you may not even be in sin. And it's like, well, it's just part of, you know, either being in the devil's world or it's part of God's uh, sanctification of you or whatever. But you're not going to be able to tell by omens. So it's got to be, am I in sin? I need to repent regardless of how I feel right now. Whether I feel things are going great or I feel things are going bad, it doesn't matter. I need to stop doing evil and learn to do good. Notice that too, that Isaiah says, stop doing evil. You already know how to do that. Learn to do good. Something you have to train yourself to do. It's not natural for us anymore because in our rebellion in Adam, what's natural is to do evil. And to call it good, of course. None of us thinks we're doing evil. <laughs> everybody wants to make their evil out to be, well, I had a good excuse for my evil. And that's what everybody does. They do what's right in their own eyes, as we've talked about many times before. That's the description of the wicked man in the Bible. Doing what's right, but in his own eyes, not in God's. <clears throat> and so, again, we can't judge based on looking at our lives, whether or not we should repent and whether we're good with God. We have to judge based on the word of God whether or not we are actually following the Lord and whether or not we are actually truly repenting, seeking to stop what we're doing that's evil and learning to do good according to God. All right, anything else? 
All right, let's go ahead and end in a word of prayer. And actually, uh, Alexander, I'm going to have you pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this lesson. Please help us to use it as, throughout the week and grow, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.